Okay, so uh, so today we'll uh, essentially complete a, a proof of one theorem uh, that is to give uh, the definition of a zero knowledge proof. Uh, let me have my board correctly. Uh, I do need a top board. So so I will define zero knowledge proof. And present one example uh, to uh, uh, with the full proof that uh, it has a, a zero knowledge proof. And, uh, and next time, uh, build upon what we had, I will prove a theorem, a theorem to say every MP complete problem, every MP problem has zero knowledge proof. So, 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 so this statement actually is very general. It's more than just the example I'm going to give. Okay. So, so last time we discussed this notion called interactive proof. <clears throat> so this is a, 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 in some sense a mild extension of what we usually consider for MP uh, class. So interactive proof follow the following simple diagram. Imagine you have a language belong to it's, it's a subset of, uh, let's say, 0, 1, 2, n. You have family of languages, so those languages could be three sets, could be callability, could be TSP, could be any of the traditional problems we see uh, in, 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 in the decision problem. So, uh, the decision problem basically wants to design Whether a particular x belongs to the language. So that's a decision problem. I give you a decision problem, I ask you to decide if this belongs to the language. Right? Just like I give you a graph, I ask you is the graph three colorable? Or I give you a formula, I'm asking you is the formula satisfiable? Okay. So MP has a, a natural interactive proof that is uh, you have a prover and you have a verifier. <laughs> they just conduct one round of uh, uh, communication. Then they can establish a, this schema where the, this input is part of language. So part of NP, so if this happens to be in NP, if L belongs to NP, if this language is NP language, it means that whenever x is in L, there is a witness that you can verify in polynomial time. Whenever x belongs to a language, there is a witness. Just like whenever a, a, a three set is satisfiable, there is an assignment to make it true. Right. So, so the traditional NP framework is basically the prover just sends in the witness namely the assignment or the coloring or whatever, and uh, the verifier just simply decide yes or no. Okay. And in this case, the verify is a polynomial time machine, and the prover is an all-powerful machine. So the prover can scan through the, all the solution space and offer a solution. And Verify's job is to simply verify, to check, right? So, <clears throat> so NP is precisely defined in this, lab, in this framework that has the following property. The first property is completeness. That is, if X is in the language, then there's a way for prover to to get verified to say yes. Because the prover is all powerful, so it has a way to offer a solution and verify to say yes. Right. The complete means that if x belongs to language, then uh, in this way, for the prover to convince. And 
and uh, the sound on this states that uh, if x is not in a language, in a traditional sense, there's no way a prover can get verified to say yes. Right? So that that's the part of sound. If x is not in a language, there's no way. So this is our traditional way of MP, right? That is, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the language can be a mathematical statement, and uh, the proof we want to show is true, so and hence it offers a proof, and the verifier just uses the logic to, to verify it, right? Or the, the, the input could just be homework, that, then the student needs to offer a solution, and the professor will read it. Right, so this is uh, our traditional schema for NP. So this is uh, a sort of logical way of NP. Right? And uh, <coughs> traditionally, these two are enforced with strictness. Namely, if X is in the language, the X pass to go through because. Here we assume P is all powerful. That's the only reason it can go through. And X is not in the language because it is a false. So there's no way for the prover to move forward. Okay. So so interactive proof relaxed some of the requirement in three ways. First of all, it allow multiple com communications. They can go back and forth and back and forth. Right? So, 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 so the prover can just say, here is what I think, and the verifier said, uh, and here's another question, and the prover has to address that question. So it's almost like uh, an oral exam, that uh, student do some presentation, professor ask some questions, student has to answer accordingly, more adaptively, and the professor will ask a few more questions. And eventually, it will be passed and fail. Right. So, so first of all, it's a law. You can do a few more iterations. This actually didn't change the name of the game. What changed the name of the game is that uh, they allow completeness or soundness to be approximated. So that's the key alteration. And uh, the prover's interactive system typically set up a confidence parameter. Set up a confidence parameter. Almost like, this is just almost like probability statement now, right? That is, uh, uh, <coughs> for example, today when we conducting a lot of polls, right? The election is coming next week, and each poll will make a statement. Right now, uh, who is this number? Who is this number? And it's within margin of three percent error, right? All the polls actually indicating a margin of error. Right? Either they say 2.5, 3.5, 4% errors. And these errors came from some polling, which means they don't know for sure. Right? It, that's why I call it polling. Right? Polling means that uh, you use incomplete information to make a projection. Right? But polling usually are, uh, in most of the time, actually are uh, meaningful. To a certain degree, they actually often correlate to the outcome. Right? So, so here, this delta is almost corresponding to this uh, 3%, 1%, and 2%. And in the most loose way, one can define that the completeness, you can either enforce strictly, or you can say, if x belongs to L, if x belongs to L, then the prover can convince the verifier with probability at least 1 minus delta. It's only fail at 30%. Right? So that's usually <laughs> one way. And usually, the soundness is the one which we subject them to the errors. That is, uh, if a language is not, actually it's not in the language, which means the mathematical statement is false, 
And we can say that there's no way the prover can convince the verifier with the probability greater than uh, so the so that, that's one of the usual way to formulate, right? So if you really think about this as a logging into ATM machine, right? So, so to us, interactive proof or mathematical proof has no other meaning. We're only facing the so-called ATM machine problem, right? So ATM machine problem basically says that uh, <coughs> I want to go to this machine, I want to log on to get $500. Right? So I go to this machine, <coughs> the machine will ask me questions, I will answer questions, the machine will ask me questions, I will answer questions. Right? The completeness proof says that uh, if I am who I am, which means I'm holding a formula that is true. So then, the completeness traditional means that uh, I can always log on to my ATM machine to get $500. So that's the strictness. Right. The soundness used to say is following, if I'm not the person who's supposed to get that account, the person is not me, then there should be no way to get into my account to get $500. Right. That's strict uh, soundness. And uh, the approximate soundness essentially says that uh, even though someone is not me who tried to log on to the machine, the probability the person can get on the machine is less than 30%. Right. So this is what I said, is that the bank then will take the 30% and buy insurance. Right. That's how they can provide the practical solutions in the bank system. Right. That's essentially bank guarantee. You. That is, uh, uh, if eventually you settle, it's not you, you prove it's just not me who will get the money, they will refund you the money. Right. In turn, they will take insurance to protect the assets. So, so, so this, <coughs> in some sense, you can treat a little bit like practical twist of mathematical property, right? Practical. So that is, a, if a statement is false, there's still some chance the prover can be lucky enough to convince the verifier, right? It's not uh, the prover can always convince the verifier. So in order to do that, one thing crucial to interactive proof that I did this is randomness. Randomness is in some sense our closer friend in this class, right? Crypto won't be existing without randomness. Right? So, so with help of random, randomness, we can talk about this language. And for now, I assume randomness resides privately in the player. Namely, each player can produce their own random strings, and the other player don't know what this random string means. Okay? So, so those are the, essentially the broad extension of our NP definition into interactive proof. That is, uh, <coughs> we allow prover and verify to use randomness. So intuitively, most useful randomness is come from verify, right? Intuitively, right? Because uh, uh, the prover are prof students who try to pass the exam and verify the professor, try to make sure the students study, so then they will use their randomness to keep students guessing a little bit so that they study more, right? So you can really trade this as a game the power to the verify, but we'll see it also used in, in the place of uh, uh, the prover, okay? So, so, so last time I gave an example of such proof system for graph non-isomorphism. I showed even though graph non-isomorphism is not known to be NP, it has such proof. Right. So, <coughs> so today I would like to expand this notion a little bit by adding what, what we call a sense of knowledge. And because we learn enough probability and we try to formulate this set of knowledge, and uh, so I would like to use again also graph isomorphism as my example. To uh, so let me decide whether you go with graph isomorphism or so maybe let me just go with either the problem that we all know. Prove some a number is quadratic residue. 
that's probably the easiest one we know because we, we saw it in probability encryption, we saw it in multiple places. Okay, so let me switch my lecture ordering to, to go to talk one simple proof and then we can use it as an example to define what knowledge is. So here is the problem. Remember that we, for a very long time, we are facing this problem. You have number n, which is a large PQ. They are primes, large primes. And we said that uh, according to the Chinese remainder theorems, the dn star essentially are divided into four regions, right? The regions cause quadratic residue. Right, those are the perfect squares, mod n. And these regions we call pseudo-quadratic residue. Those are the non-perfect squares whose Jacobi symbol is equal to 1. Right? And those two are the Jacobi symbols equal to negative 1. Remember, earlier we said Jacobi symbol can be computed in polynomial time. Therefore, the hardness is to distinguish this against this pseudo-image. So those are corresponding to all the numbers where mod p and mod q are perfect square. And those are corresponding to all the numbers where mod p and q simultaneously are non-perfect square. Right? And <coughs> so the probability encryption scheme of Goldbach and Mikani used the fact that uh, so far we have no way to determine this from this in polynomial time. Therefore, they declare those are just invisible inks. Right, so then when they write messages, they just use them to write, and only people who know PQ can go in and to decode them. Right, so that's why they use the invisible inks. Okay? So, so let's consider the following simple problem. I give you x belongs to the n star, and I knew the Jacobi symbol of x is equal to 1. Okay? So this is input. And I want to, uh, uh, my language, L, is basically equal to QR. Right? My language, L, is a QR facing such input. Right. So, namely, I ignore these two regions, numbers, I only consider this just like in the zero knowledge proof, in the probability encryption case. Right? Remember, those are our invisible inks for encryptions, like that. <coughs> and also we use them for pseudo-random number generation, for example, in the uh, blum blum sub scheme. Right? So this is a, one of the primary decision problems. So far it's not clear this is in AP. Uh, this is a, in polynomial time. So far it's not clear this is in polynomial time. <coughs> so suppose I want to use this to design the following ATM machine. So let me just consider the following way to set up code for ATM machine. Right. So here is a bank, and here is a customer. Right. So imagine that uh, when we try to set up an account, what we want to set up an account. So so here is you can consider this a bank. Right. So bank. Actually, hold many ATM machines, right? Traditionally, you know, all over the world. Uh, I'm sure many of us has experience taking money out of our foreign banks or banking in different city, and uh, it's a convenient. Actually, has best uh, interest, uh, you know, exchange rates, right? It's better than you use any other mechanism, right? So, so because you don't face much penalty when you withdraw money, right? So. <coughs> So, so, so one way to think about this is following that. Uh, uh, so, what is password? Right. Remember, before we all said a password. If you give out, it's so dangerous. But we always give out the password. But whenever we log in, we give out the password. That's why it's dangerous. Right. So, password we want to keep privately, but we keep on giving out. It's a paradox. So let's create a password ish schema. That I'm not giving out my password. I'm only trying to convince you. Right? So, so one way one can consider this is the following. That us, 
almost like in public key schema, we will create our own password. So which means it will generate the n equal to pq. Okay. Then it will choose a password. Uh, so let me call this password uh, uh, beta. So we have a password beta that belong to QR. That belong to QR. Okay. So intuitively, what is password of beta? Because beta is in QR, which means beta has to be written as gamma square mod n. Right? This is what it means. And this is the equivalent, right? So which means if I give you a perfect square, <coughs> you have a square root. Right? You have square roots. So, so imagine that uh, uh, the bank system, this bank system, when they create an account, essentially what they create is this, this thing, beta square and gamma. Right? And uh, it will give the customer gamma, that's the password, and it will keep in the bank system called your name, you uh, us, and then my password is beta square beta. So this is how it stores, right? It has n, uh, p and q. Uh, it has n. It's not even p and n. Just n, right? It has n. So so the trust is the way it produce these pairs and privately give the person gamma. And it the only thing we have right now is a gamma square. So, so, so this means that uh, this person, this person, us, knew a number that is square root of the, the thing stored on the computer associated with his name, right? So this, this is like a reasonable setup, right? And, you know, before basically, so this person has R, gamma, and the machine has beta. In the past, the machine has gamma, you have gamma, that's why you type in your gamma and it just match it. Right? So our password <coughs> is almost like a private key system. Right? That we and the machine agree on a, a, a code, then suddenly I have to give out my code. The machine just check for equivalence. Right? So, 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 so that's why it's crazy. <coughs> right? That's why we have to give out our code, then we said, uh, who's still our code? We just give it all our code every time we need to log on to the machine, right? So, but in this system, the name of the game is not that I need to give out my code. The name of the game is I prove I have my code. You can see that's a different task. I prove I have my code. Which means I want to prove I have a square root of beta. Because nobody else can compute square root of beta according to this polynomial time assumption. So this way, if I prove that I have square root of beta, I'm the one who set up the account. Okay? So this is how is it, this problem is needed right now, right? So who are we? Let, let's let's uh, flatter ourselves. Let's say we are polynomial time machines. I mean, that's a clearly horrible assumption, right? We are constant time machines, <laughs> right? But, but let's call, we are polynomial time machines. Why we are polynomial time machines? Because we are armed with computing device. But we are just constant time machines. So what is the difference between this and the password? In the end, you provide one value. And? Like in the end, you provide one value. So what is yeah. the difference between So the, I, I will show you. I will show you through what it means to be logged in, okay? In the past, how do you log in? You have to give out the gamma, right? That, that's how we log in. That's how you get your money anyway, right? You, you, how many digits we said? Four, four digits, right? Are there any time you refuse to give you four digits and you get you $500 without walking into the bank? Never happened, right? You, you actually was forced to get, uh, give up your four digits, right? If there is a camera watching you there, 
Is it four digits in public now? Has to be. Right? Okay? So let me talk about the schema that the ATM actually didn't receive gamma. And then it will be convinced to give you money. So this, loosely speaking, is zero knowledge proof. <coughs> that is, you somehow keep on talking to ATM machine, at the end of the ATM machine just said, fine, I'm convinced, here is your $500. But somebody else came and, and tried to talk to the ATM machine, and they will struggle with high probability. So this is called zero knowledge proof. This is called zero knowledge proof. So, <coughs> so, 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 so let me try. Uh, the scenario is clear right now, right? Uh, the prover, which means us, trying to log in, has a gamma, which happened to be the square root of a number stored in the system, which is called beta. OK? And beta can even make it public. That's why beta, there's no, nobody protect beta, it's only protect gammas. Okay? No one protect. So, so which means we are dealing a prover and a, uh, we're dealing a prover and a verifier. So what is the input now? The input now is, uh, so this v is v t f, v is equal to ATM, right? And this P is the customer, right? So the customer deep down holding gamma, and uh, beta is the challenge. Beta A is challenge. Right. So when you type in, you, you know, when you landed in some city, uh, uh, you know, anywhere you can name, Iceland, and. Uh, uh, I think that's the last European city I visited. So, so then you basically put in your card, they, they just pop up with beta to say, prove to me beta, you know the square root of beta. Simple task, right? And clearly one way to do is you just give up gamma. One way to do is just give up gamma, right? Because uh, what, but you don't want to do that, that's too dangerous. That's too dangerous. So then you, Conduct the following protocols. Okay. So let me show you a protocol. The prover send a random number. Prover just typing a random perfect square. So x is a random number. How do, how do we do this? We can just assume it is do the following, right? So, the, so here is a, the, the program for the prover. So it has gamma to start with. It randomly produces a y in the end star. Randomly, so it's random. Right? Then it computes x equal to y square mod n. You know, we are polynomial time machines, we can do this. Or we, our cell phone can do this. Okay? So you just put X here. When you log on the machine, you just log on with random numbers. Did you convince the machine so far? Should the ATM just give you the money? It's crazy. <laughs> that would be crazy, right? But, you know, this Iceland, it may happen. So, so, so then the machine, ATM machine, okay, the ATM machine choose a random number i, down to zero times one. So this is almost like Turing test now, right? You can see all our schema are very close to this thing. I somehow want to do wine tests. I want you to resolve a subtle difference right now. <clears throat> so, so then it just pop out a y, i in, back. I. So what does i means? So let me give you a semantics of i. 
the semantic, the semantic of i is following. If i is equal to 1, uh, let me say, say 0. If i equal to 0, it asks for square root. So let me just uh, use this notion. Everybody else tell I I should just say square root square root of x. It asks for this. If i is zero, it just asks for square root of x. Okay. If i equal to one, it will ask for square root of x times beta. So that's the challenge. So this is called commitment. It's called challenge. And then clearly you have to reply, respond, right? So how do how do you should respond? You can respond in two ways. If i equal to zero, how do you respond? Just give up the y, right? If i equal to 1, what do you give up? You give up gamma times 1. So this is the whole protocol. That's one wrong login. We, 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 can, we can enhance this, but let's just look at one wrong login. So here is what happened, you went to Iceland, <laughs> you stick your card into the machine, the machine top out the beta. Long, you know, maybe a thousand bits, it had larger screen. And then, you look at it, you produce a perfect square called X, you produce a random Y, which it, you can just go to your uh, cell phone and say random Y squared, and you look at your cell phone and you just copy the the x onto the panel. So, <coughs> so ATM will keep uh, y x here. Right. ATM will keep x here. And then ATM machine, this bank, just did a very simple thing. Flip a coin. If it had, it sent 0. If tail, it sent 1. Right? So when you see a hat, you will just send out the y. When you see the tail, you ask your iPhone to multiply gamma with y. So that's why it's dangerous for your iPhone, right? It actually holds a secret. If you lose your iPhone, you may, you may lose money. Okay? But for now, if you don't like iPhone, make yourself a polynomial time machine so that you can do this multiplication. You train yourself to do fast multiplications. Right? So then basically we just send gamma times y mod n. Did I straightforwardly give out my password yet? No, right? <coughs> I tried to log on. I didn't give out my password in this case. Clean so far, right? The schema is clean right now, right? There's no trace right now, right? There's no trace. Okay? So what do the bank do? The bank will do the following. If I equal to uh, bank simply to compute another numbers, let's call z equal to x times beta to the i. Right? This is what the bank do, right? It just on sign just multiply your number. Either with beta or not with beta, depending on the random coins. <coughs> right? So the verify basically is that, suppose this is your response. So, so let's just call this your response, right? So this is what you send, but let's call this your response. Let's call this to be uh, your response. Let me take a name. What is response? Answers. Let's just call that A, right? That's your answers. So you give an answer either A equal to this or A equal to this. So, so, so the bank just simply check if a square is equal to z. This is what the bank do. 
Check A square equal to 3 or not. Okay. Right. If yes, it will give you 500 dollars. If no, it will silently call police. Or just reject it. No, can reject it. So this is a viable ATM uh, protocol, no? It's viable enough, right? Simple enough. It's not overly human sound yet, at least conceptually. Other than the fact that we don't know how to multiply. You know how to multiply, not everybody knows how to multiply in reality. Yeah. I, I don't get why why we use this I. Why not you just using I equal one all the time? I equal to one. Yeah, you will see why. There's a critical purpose why this has to be random. Without random, this thing will collapse. Very good. Because the ultimately, when we argue, we have to know why we why we do it this way, right? Why we do a random challenge? That's why I'm trying to say is so that when a professor asks random questions, student has to prepare more. Agree? You know the. Um, <coughs> I, I, I joined uh, Boston University in 2002. Uh, it was a very small department in a, in a good city. Uh, BU is in every sense almost like USC, except it's a more uh, college based. You know, they have a huge college and a very small engineering, uh, uh, what do you call professional schools. And in fact, in fact, they hired someone from USC eventually to be the provost after I came. So, 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 computer science department used to have the following type of qualifying exam for PhD students in theory, in theoretical computer science. So we normally ask a student to take an exam in complexity theory and algorithm. So we assign two to three papers in each of the area, and the students will uh, read them and produce two PowerPoint slides, then they will give two hour presentations of complexity theory facing questions, algorithm facing questions. Okay. And each of those exams scheduled is half a day for one person. So you have multiple professors sitting there just half day. And then it's very hard to schedule because it, it, people teach, there's a lot of conflict at the time. And students complain, say, I can never get the professor agree for an hour. So, so, so I was just teaching those materials, and uh, I went to this meeting as new faculty. So, so that, that's I think now, nowadays they use the following scheme: the student showed up with his two PowerPoint slides, and the first thing they did is that uh, the, 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 the the chair of the faculty body of the committee, usually these four people. We take a quarter and flip, and it's landed. If it had, they do complexity. If it's tail, they do algorithm. Okay? So then they can use five minutes to briefly talk about the other one. So, what you mean is they have to prepare four sets of slides a five minute summary, a 45 minute presentation, five minute summary, 45 minute presentation, and during the exam time, a random set will be asked to do a full set and five minutes, right? So, so as students, can you not prepare both sets? Too much. You have to have a lot of faith in that coins. Mm -hmm. Agree? Mm -hmm. But, if you have a lot of faith in that coins, why should you prepare two? It's wasting your time. But you want to pass the test. So would you risk not to do the other one? Right? Because you don't know a priori. So this random coin is roughly towards that. And to make sure that you're prepared to answer both questions. But it's only asking one. Right? So 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 then suddenly we reduce the exam time to an hour and thirty minutes. <coughs> then everybody's happy. 
at the beginning, students complained a little bit. They said, you know, why should I prepare two and then facing a random sets? Then they thought about it because this way they can actually schedule their exam. And also, they only need to talk for an hour rather than two hours, right? So, so, so it turned out, you know, this eventually we adopted that. I, I remember my students showed up. <coughs> this guy, Konstantin uh, Wawoski, showed up. The coin flipped. I can't flip the coin, so somebody else flipped. Steve Homer flipped. It's landed, and he needs to do complexity. This is a kid in algorithm section. So, so, so even at that time, one of the faculty said, are we really sure want, we want him to do a, a complexity? We said, the coin is that, yes. So then he had, you know. Uh, so that's where randomness is. Right. So, so I will narrowly explain this. Okay. So any question about the protocol so far, this logging? This is a very simple protocol, right, logging. Right, so you have the square root of another number, and giving that number, computationally, we assume it's hard to compute the square root. So this, therefore, if you prove you have the square root of the other number, then you know the secret. Then you earn your right to log in to get your five hundred dollars, right? But if you flunk the test, you will be rejected, right? Because uh, Bank need to protect your account and it needs to reject it. Agree? So, so let's think about the, the sense of completeness and soundness here. So that's why I want to illustrate as a completeness and soundness right now. So what is what is the completeness for this problem? If if you are who you are, can you log on to your machine? Mm. If you play accordingly. You will come into the verify, right? Because uh, you can choose a random number, you square it, and when it's challenging for that, you just release y. Otherwise, you just multiply y against gamma. Since uh, gamma is the square root of beta, then clearly gamma y is the square root of uh, 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 x times beta. Right? So, so this is hundred percent. Okay? So which means that the bank will never reject you if you want to get your five hundred dollars. Clear for now? The bank will not reject you if you want to get your five hundred dollars. Okay. So let's look at the soundness. So instead of you going to Iceland, I go to Iceland. I want to get you the five hundred dollars from your bank. Why not? Right? Right, so I want to get five hundred dollars from your bank, and uh, so uh, can I do the first step? I can easily do the first step, right? Intuitively, right? So let's just think about it. Uh, I follow the early protocol right now. I did the first step, x. Suppose x is perfect square, right? This means I did it perfectly. So then, basically, <coughs> uh, what I challenge is happened. 50% chance is asking for square root of x. Right? So that 50% I will, I will log on. Agree? You will lose $500 half time right now. Right? But only $250 for now. In expectation, right? So, so the other chance when you ask for 1, I have to give the square root of x times beta. Given that I know the square root of x, if I compute the square root of x times beta, which means I know square root of beta. Agree? If I'm able to answer the, 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 the one question, if the coin is one, so that's complexity theory test, right? If I'm so professional in complexity theory, I actually get the beta already, the gamma of your beta already. So which means I, or, I stole your password beforehand. Right? If it's computation impossible for me to compute the beta in Iceland on the fly, then I will flunk my second question. Okay? So that should cheat. Right? So what you mean at the beginning, I shouldn't give you x as a perfect square. Well, I shouldn't give you x that I somehow know. So I, I should try to, suppose you, you give me the number to be this. 
Z. Right? So what is Z to you? To the bank? What is Z to the bank you have? This is just a random number. Right? So which means that uh, if I cheat, when I, if I guess to be second one, I should divide out the beta. <laughs> right? Then when you ask me to multiply it back, I get my x, I got the square root. Right? So if you ask me one, I can cheat. How do I cheat? I just simply take x square, try to log on. Instead of giving x square, I define my x tilde equal to x divided by beta. This I can compute, beta is given. And I can throw x tilde here. So then if you always ask for one, suppose Iceland bank is so frozen, it's only giving you ask for one. So then I can actually log on to 100%. Because all I do is just give you this number. And, and since I'm facing answer of x times beta, this number times beta the square root, if I knew the square root, I, I don't even need to know the square root of beta. Right? So you can see this i, the random coin, is purely used to ensure that I have to prepare both homeworks. Just like in view. But on the other hand, in order to prepare both homeworks, I must know gamma. Right? I, can't answer, I can't prepare both homework without gamma. So which means I can prepare one of the homework, hoping you're asking me for that question. And uh, I think most of the time, I was facing an exam I couldn't finish reading. That's essentially what I did. I'm sure everybody did, right? You take a guess, you read the sections, you go to the exam, and uh, Murphy lost that. Is they always take test the other one, right? So, so you can see why th th this I is used, right? Everyone understand this problem. So, which means that if I don't know gamma, I can't compute it. What's probability I can log on? Fifty percent. Good. So this is fifty. Delta is equal to fifty. So, which means. Instead of losing $500, you're only losing for $250. You have to be happy. <coughs> right? But how do you reduce you, uh, this, this, this amount? You can ask that to do twice. So that will reduce to $125. Still too expensive. You can ask the bank say three times. You have to run three times. That will, that will reduce to $60. Still too expensive. You can for example, if you run 10 times, essentially, the $500 just become the ATM fee now. Right? Agree? So, so, the, so we can control this data in this game. To log on. Okay. So this, so far, I did nothing different yet from last time. I did a graph analysis of my right? All I proved is that uh, I now have a system allow you to have interactive proof that have 100% completeness. If you who you are, you log on, get your hand and in. And it has controlled soundness. If you know who you are, you will lose a dollar. In expectation. In expectation. The probability you, you can control to be one over 500 times, someone can break through. So you will lose the ATM fee. Okay? So, where's zero knowledge proof come from? How do they prove actually that this ATM machine, imagine not just, not just a person who watches this machine, and suppose this bank machine was set up by someone who actually wants to steal passwords. Right? Because when you put ATM machine here, you never put the customer passcode there. Right? So which means this ATM machine actually do not know the passcode. But suppose the ATM machine wants to learn the passcode. If you log in straightforwardly, that machine knows your pass password. Agree? Okay? You know, which means my you know my bank account has 
print the left in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Europe. I mean, every time they ask, I just gave, right? You all get the few hundred dollars out. Right? So if those ATM machine want to get, the, get your code, <coughs> they will get your code, right? In the past. But let's see what the ATM machine will get your code in. Okay, so this is the zero knowledge part. Right? I claim after logging like this. Even ATM gave you five hundred dollars. It has no information. Off your code. So this is a statement I want to prove mathematically. <coughs> After these interactions, the ATM machine did not get any information of your code. I'm not even talking about get some information of your code. The ATM machine gets zero information of your code. So you may say, how that could be? They just give me five hundred dollars, right? They just give you have you know you log along, you know because we have completeness. You go there, you 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 you, you know they ask you you want to draw probability to be one over five hundred. You need to essentially run how many times to log one over five hundred. So you need to run like nine times, right? Nine times you drop the five hundred, right? So you did nine times this this game. And then basically you walk away with your $500. Then you're wondering, gosh, Iceland's dangerous. What if I lost my code there? Right? And uh, I'm going to prove to you, you don't have to worry. You'll, you'll leak nothing in Iceland. If somebody steals your code, it's through otherwise. Some other means. It has nothing to do with the exchange. This exchange is totally perfect. You just convince the machine to give you $500, nothing more than this. Okay? Nothing more than this. Okay. So, so that's me proving this data. So how do we prove it? That's why it's kind of fascinating the first time to formulate, right? A time just proof, you left nothing behind. Luckily, the first time they have an example to prove you have left nothing behind. If to prove you left a small thing behind, it's much harder to prove, you can see, right? So that's why mathematically, this is a very beautiful, perfect problem to start with. You left nothing behind. Okay? So let's just eyeball here, right? Let's just eyeball here. What did you offer? You offer an X. Does this have anything to do with your code? No. X has nothing to do with your code. Agree? X is just random number. Right? So the first step is clearly your code. Intuitively. Right? So the second step is challenging. Clearly you, you, you lost nothing of your code, right? Because so the only possibility is the third step, the combination of first and second, you may lose your code. Right? But if the person asks coin to be zero, so that's related with your question, why don't you always ask one, right? If you ask a zero, did you lose your code? You didn't even use your code, <laughs> right? So if y, y and x are independent of your code, so which means you lost nothing of your code, okay? So now, the only thing is second step. What if the bank asks for one, right? Because if you have to log on nine times, right, remember? Essentially, four or five times you are doing the second question, right? An expectation. But half the time you do one of the questions, right? So second, so you, you need to answer this, <coughs> uh, this number. So here is what all the number you showed on the table. You have x, y squared. So none of this matters. Sometimes you are, you're giving y, 
and sometimes you're giving y times r. Right? And you were never asked to, to provide the y and y times gamma simultaneously. This was never asked. Not a single time you need to deliver y or y times gamma. Right? Remember like this view test. You're only asking for a complexity question or you're asking for a wisdom question. You will never ask for both. <laughs> right? So, so you never ask for the test. You know this branch has no information. Right? The question is, uh, does this branch have any information? You assume your gamma is a random code. So, <coughs> this number is a random number. That's an intuition. But we can't mathematically rely on intuition, right? So, which means without a y, this is just a random number. Agree? Because we all know that number times random number is random number. Your code is random. Right? So, 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 so therefore, intuitively, you left nothing behind, right? But, but, but mathematics are weird stuff, right? You know, uh, I mean, proof is a subtle thing. For example, uh, last Wednesday, actually, we were in a fairly excited state that we have actually conference deadline today for one of the premier conferences in theoretical computer science. And I was part of a team of three uh, planning to submit a paper, which we were very excited about. And uh, we got a preliminary version written actually after I gave it last week's lecture. And on Friday, we were kind of sure that this will, will go forward. And Friday evening, we find a bug. <laughs> Actually, at that time, we didn't even find a bug. We just uh, find a, a weird statement. If whatever we proved, then the following might be true. That is, uh, if you have an open interval between 0 and 1, can you cover this open interval by closed intervals? The answer is yes, clearly. You just, uh, using the number to cover it, right? Because every number is close to the interval of itself. So, it's a little bit of a twist. Can you cover an open interval with unions of non-singleton closed intervals? And we, we look at this, we don't have answers. It, 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 it clearly sound of one of the weird questions which was studied in measure theory or, right? Can you cover close open interval with Unions of non closing, uh, uh, union of closing intervals. So, so said Google, he said, we Googled after a while. And there's a, a, a discussion board by Perry Tao. Perry Tao is one of the, I think, top five or top three mathematicians of this century teaching at UCLA. Okay? So, Perry Tao had a post. He said, uh, uh, this is a last year post, I think last year post. He said, uh, in my undergraduate class, one of the students asked me, can I, can I cover open interval with a countable number of close interval? So that's re rule out the, 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 the individual ones, right? Because countable rule out the individual one. And uh, he said, uh, in the classroom, I didn't have an answer. <laughs> We're talking about the mathematics. One of the top three mathematicians in the world for this century. Right? I didn't have an answer. And uh, I really like my student because at the end of class, some students began to send me proofs that you can't do it. So then this folder is a compilation of all my students sent to me. Right? This is a very sweet uh, folder, right? And people make a different type of argument. Apparently, one of the deep argument is that uh, the uh, open intervals it's a, a countable. You can only have a countable number of intervals. So somehow we can use that to say, if that's true, then it's just not true. Because the number of intervals you use is a, uh, will be countable, which is not true. Because you didn't cover the whole thing. So, so, so that's the short proof. But, but that that's, that's make us realize, gosh, I think our claim is wrong, because somewhere it's implied this. Right? So, I didn't sleep last, uh, last night at all, but we didn't fix the proof. <laughs> we didn't fix the proof. Okay, so, so, you know, that's why claim is easy, right? Intuitions can be there. It may not be true. 
right? I have the delivery approved, right? It's, you know, it, it, it research is, is a, it has many interesting twists. We still believe we will push through, I mean, hopefully after the next few months, but uh, yeah, just not sure. Uh, so, so let me see how do we formulate this proof, right? So let's see how much time I have to do this proof. Good, I, I, I'm, I'm right on my reverse target. So, so let me try to formulate this proof, right? We have to figure out how, what we mean is zero knowledge, right? So essentially we have to define what is zero knowledge. Right? Zero knowledge here is our intuition that we left nothing behind Iceland after we log on to the machine there. Okay? It's literally mean that. Right? How do I formulate this? So here is a really clever formulation. <coughs> so, so, so this comes from the paper uh, Goldwasser, Mikali, uh, Charlie Rakoff. So, so those two just won the Turing Award a few, I think a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, zero knowledge proof is part of the major contribution, but they won from a thread of you know, probability encryption through the random number generation, and uh, uh, the committee decided to leave him out, actually, in, the, in, in, in this uh, uh, award. So, so here is a really clever idea they did. So how do we improve? That the, the, the ATM machine didn't steal our house code. <laughs> right? How do we how do we even set this up? ATM machine literally didn't steal our passcode. Right? So they find this shortcut of proof as following. It's a notion called simulator. <coughs> so here is a a related dilemma. Let me just uh, pause for you, right? So you went to Iceland. You talk to this machine for nine times, and you log on, you went home. It's $500, right? And the person who is running this machine has to answer to the bank. Right? It's responsible to answer to the bank. So the bank clearly will ask this who is responsible for this machine, why do you give me 500 bucks? Right? The bank has to, to, to ensure this it happened properly. Agree? So, so what can the ATM machine do? The ATM machine traditionally do when you just release the tape of communication. That's the only way the ATM machine says, look, this is a tape of communication. That's why at the end of the game, you told me by policy I have to give $500. I gave it, right? So what is this communication tape? So, so this is not simulator now, so let's just say tape. So what is communication history, the tape? The tape is just a bunch of the exchange, right? So this tape basically says x1, i1, and uh, what I call is a a1, right? So this is a, the first question, right? The first time with the wrong. And then basically x2, y2, a2. So we did it nine times, right? So we did it nine times, right? Because we want to make sure that the expected loss is a, a, a transaction fee of one dollar, right? <coughs> so we did nine times. This is the tape, right? Then at end of tape, they said accept. That's all happened, right? If from this record perspective, or someone has a video, a video camera just captured the whole thing, that's just all happened, right? That is, uh, you enter X1, the bank turn in the eye, and uh, <coughs> you give the answer, right? Da, 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 right? So, 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 so in some sense, for the ATM machine to convince the bank, In some sense, it's intuitively sufficient to release this tape, right? Because this tape is record that the, the, 
the machine did what it asked to do, right? It asked to produce random coins and it asked to check check the the, 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 the answers. And you can verify you check answers, you're always successful. Right? So 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 that's that, right? So essentially this tape is the proof left behind, and clearly, if anything information about your code, it has to be in the tape, because there's nothing else there, right? The entire communication is recorded here, right? And if this tape contains no information about your secret, you left nothing behind. Agree? Okay? Right? This is a, this is all the data has, right? So you 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 you, you someone literally take, keep this thing. But let's have a, 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 a let's think ATM actually people were responsible for something. So 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 let's see that uh, the ATM machine bank has following regulations. If ATM machine could cannot turn over tape match that time in exchange, then bank will punish the person in charge of ATM machine for five hundred dollars. That's only fair, right? If your employee didn't do the right thing, the bank will charge them. They did that from salary. Okay. So suppose <coughs> this exchange happens. The clerk takes the tape. You know, it need to move to store it in the office in case the bank asks it will give, right? It's put code there and it's destroyed. <laughs> Support in the process, it took code, this thing was erased. <coughs> right, next day when bank asked the ATM machine to say, uh, why did you give him $500? The ATM machine look at the pocket, it didn't have the tape anymore. Right? Should the ATM machine just pay $500? Most likely it has, right, because it has no, you know, no evidence. No, the ATM machine actually cannot, don't have to do this in this protocol. So here is a forged tape. So, this, so let's see the ATM machine, it after lost the tape, attempt to forge the tape. Okay? So how do it can forge the tape? If no, it has nylon. If no, at end it has to accept. Right? Because it gave out 500 bucks. So what this ATM machine will do, in order not to pay the five hundred dollars the bank is asking to pay, if it couldn't give a tape, tape, <coughs> it will do what everyone do, right? So it will do the following: cleverly try to forge a tape so that it will pass the test of bank, right? It has to do that, but otherwise it will lose five hundred dollars, right? So the ATM machine will do the following. It has to create those record. Notice that all those records are random. So we are not talking about a single record, we're talking about distribution of record. Yeah, everything's random, right? There's, not, there's nothing deterministic. So when ATM created a tape, because ATM talked to nobody now, right? It just talked to itself, just to create the tape. What it will do? It will not do stupid game as uh, playing this game anymore, because it doesn't know gamma, it can't do it. Right? But it can do the following. It first create random flip coin called I1. Then it random flip coin called I2. It flip all its random coin. So let's call them tilde. This it can do, right? Because it takes no effort, just flip your coin nine times and you just put the coin in there. Okay? So that once the coin is flipped, what did we do? If the coin is zero, it will just choose a random square and give out its root. If it's zero. Right? If the coin happened to be one, it will choose a random square divided by beta and give out It just feels, it cheats, right? I mean, 
Since you have no secret, you can, you can only cheat, right? So this is called a forged tape. Right? So. so let's first off say, is this tape consistent? It has to be consistent because it produces this way. Why is it consistent? Because the, the ATM machine knew which question is asked first, right? The only thing this person, you, need to prepare both questions. You don't know which question is asked. That's why without knowing I, you have to prepare both questions before the exam. Just like in BU, right? And in such process, you have to know the secret. But the moment you knew a question is asked, you can produce this thing without ever knowing the secret. Okay? So, <clears throat> if ATM machine happened to lose the tape, if you go to the bank, it just submit this, this thing. Go to the bank to say, here is the tape. What can I do? It's consistent. Nine times, I have to give him 500 bucks. Don't charge me. <laughs> right? So then the bank basically has to do the following. Hey, you forged. Right? If bank couldn't prove it's a forge, you cannot charge an employee. Because this will go to court, right? So basically, they all have to go to court. The bank had to show the court that this tape is forged. Okay? Is that forged conversation? Right? So the ATM machine, that's just not true. I have an integrity. I never forge any tapes. Right? It's consistent. People answer nine times, I give them the money. Right? So can the bank prove this tape is different from this as distribution? So basically, those are two random tapes. Are those two random tapes come from the same distribution? That's basically the question. Are those two random tapes come from the same distribution? If they come from the same distribution, it means the ATM machine knows nothing. Because it can produce the same record without even knowing the answers. Right? If you can produce the same record distribution without knowing the secret, which means this is this conversation has nothing to do with the secret. Right? Remember we talk about the perfect security, right? The cipher tax, if it is independent distribution from the plain tax, then the cipher tax has nothing to do with the plain tax. Right? That's really the, 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 the secrecy back then for us. Here is the formulation of knowledge. That in this communication, knowledge is not passed. Because what is passed? It's an independent tape. Independent of the secret. Just like in the past, it's independent of plain text distribution. Right? So the moment this tape can be forged, it's immediately mathematically proof that a distribution is just whatever is released, this is called cipher text, is independent of plain text. You can see why. The classical study of uh, communication perfectly set up in this case. Once they realize this four d tape business. So that's why it takes a long time to get this acute argument. And this argument, uh, uh, Mikhail is a good friend of mine, so I chatted with him uh, several times now. He said, oh, at the beginning, they write very massive proofs. He said, hindsight, maybe some of those are not correct. Until, you know, they came up with these very clean formulations. <laughs> right. So let's just think about why this tape are the same. I think we can almost immediately see why it's the same, right? That's distribution. <coughs> because <coughs> these are just independent coins, right? So which means that the, the, the coins in the two tape clearly are identically distributed. Right? Because it's all independent and flipped without looking at anything, right? So this coin clearly is aligned. And once the coin is aligned, there's no difference between those numbers. They're just random numbers. But the, when you divide the a QR by, by beta, this is a random. Random divided by beta is still a random number. No, no, this, this is no question. If a quadratic residue is divided by another quadratic residue, it's, it's still a quadratic residue. residue, yes. Is it? Yeah, that's a, it's close under there, right. Perfect square, square root is still perfect square. Because inverse exists. So the, the inverse square is 80 that square. Right. Agree? 
So it's, it's all closed. So which means all those things are just a bunch of random numbers that happen to satisfy the condition that uh, this would or not divide by beta depend on i is <laughs> the square of this number. And they can all be independently randomly produced. So which means that uh, the bank it is such a perfect logging system. The only loser is the bank. But this is good for people, right? Only bank don't know whether the ATM machine is cheating them. But the ATM will take the money from some accounts. <laughs> no. The only so 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 in this system, that's why bank build their own ATM machines. Mm. Which bank did it? <laughs> right? It's liable otherwise. Because in this particular system, the bank is totally powerless after this protocol is agreed. Because ATM machine can cheat on bank. But the customer cannot cheat on bank. Do you see that? So bank can't go to the court to prove that, hey, this is a forged tape. My ATM machine collapsed. Bank is responsible for their own ATM machine. So any question up to here? So this is what I call a perfect ATM protocol. Right? Because uh, I mean it's viable enough. It's not totally complex yet. I mean it's still complex enough. But on the other hand, it has essentially what we, 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 we consider as a property, somehow we digitalize, right? That is, uh, you, you want to get onto your account, and you want to make sure that people who have the credential get, get the money. And, and the only thing we can't quite protect is the perfectness when you reject somebody else wants to steal your money. But we can only control that with probabilities. We only say that the, the thing happened with a very low probability. And, uh, and, but that's become bank's problem, which in some sense is a manageable. Right? It's not customer's problem. So from, from customer pers perspective, this is a, as clean and perfect solution as it goes. Under the assumption that this problem is not computationally easy. Right? Just like an encryption scheme, right? If invisible ink exists, if this thing exists, Hard to detail, you can do public key encryption. Simultaneously, you can also do zero knowledge proof for identification. But nothing leaked. The only thing in standing in between is secure. The only thing standing in between is secure. Otherwise, the customer can cheat. Otherwise, the customer can cheat. If customers are able to solve such problem, then, you know, you have clever steps, right? So that's where it is, yeah. I have a question. I'm not sure it's inside the school. Program. Okay. Uh, so what about the ATMs that are not following a bank? Pardon me? Like lots of ATM machines are just, it's not a bank ATM machine. It's somebody else's bank's ATM machine. No, no, no. Some, some uh, ATMs are not belonging to banks. Like you go into... I don't know, some markets, some festivals, stuff like that. Find I think they usually belong to a like, consortium of banks. They have certain agreement covered by insurance against each other. And also to this system, to this system the, the, the ATM machine, you can't afford the records. Uh, right? Because this protocol, you can afford the record. Yeah. And, and in some sense, the zero knowledge isn't... Uh, Necess you know, forging record is necessary for zero knowledge. This is incredible in, in many ways, if you really think about this, right? The, the, in order to get the custom perfectly protected, it's vitally critical that uh, the ATM machine can forge uh, this actually is the equivalent statement. Because uh, if they can't, which means that uh, this tape must contain information. Right? Because if you have the secret information to produce this distribution, it's induced. 
if you can, you can't afford that, which means that uh, this tape is special tape, particularly the one Dan can decode. <laughs> right, it's a special tape, and that's why in this particular case, it's just like secret sharing. We start from day one. It went so perfectly. Yeah, it's just a phenomenal probability independence or one-time path. So that's why uh, I, I think all while when we walk away from this class, it's good to remember a few of those perfect systems. They build upon beautiful properties, you can see. In usually, our product is messier than this. Right? It happened a few times. It just The proof is just without as clean as it is. Right? So this is a notion of zero knowledge proof. And officially, that, that basically when they see this protocol, they reversely define conceptualize. What is zero knowledge proof? Zero knowledge proof is an interactive proof. Okay? Satisfy the completeness property and the soundness property with either you can be on the assumption with probability, right? This allows you to alter it a bit. <coughs> then, if your language element is in the language, complete means you should be able to log on, otherwise you should reject what may happen with exceptionally high probability. Then afterward, you were left with a tape. And this tape, if you secretly choose it uniformly, this tape is independent of that distribution. Right. If this tape is independent from that distribution, which means forgeable, without looking at the secret. Right, because it, it's a, a, you knew that the other distribution, this is independent from that distribution. Right. So this is a mathematical statement. So, so zero knowledge proof, in the perfect, this usually called a, a informational zero knowledge proof. You can see there's no assumption on zero knowledge in this. It basically means that uh, without any assumption, the system is zero knowledge. Which means it's totally independent, just like our secret sharing and uh, uh, private key encryption, uh, exclusive war. However, <coughs> the uh, soundness in this case is under computational assumption. Right, so the soundness is not perfect in the nobody can defeat it. It's only on the computation or something, like encryption scheme, right? The, the public key encryption scheme cannot be informationally secure because someone can break it. It's only when we say you have a limited computational resource, you can't break it in time. It's always about you can't break it in time. It's not about you can never break it. Now the break it is this informational sense, right? You you got distribution independent. So in this case, the soundness of the whole system in many ways is the weakest components. Luckily it is a place bank has to take insurance. So can it malfunction? Huh? Can it malfunction too? So, so it's mostly dependent upon whether this <coughs> language you like the assumption you they use. Right. Has come, you know, can be solved efficiently or not, okay. right? Because if that problem, somebody else has a, a fast solution on quantum computer or something, mm -hmm. then, then they can, they, they, not only they get you five hundred dollars, they get everything, mm -hmm. right? They, 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 if you are able to solve those problems, you can emulate those things, mm -hmm. right? So that's why the assumption of soundness is computational. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the the property of completeness is informational in this process. So this usually we call a perfect zero knowledge proof, which means that uh, uh, information is uh, uh, there's no compromise regardless. Yeah. Now I really feel like uh, you know. Years past. When, when, when I first came, I came to this country in 85. And uh, 
uh, this paper was published in 85. And I took Len Edelman's class in 86. Uh, at that time, Len is teaching crypto. And zero knowledge proof was, you know, it just newly happened, so he covered it in the class. So, 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 now hindsight, I'm among the first generation who actually learned uh, this material in the class rather than like research reading. It just, people began to teach in the class. Yeah. And uh, um, I should tell, tell them that. I, uh, because Len's office is very close to mine, we are in the same building. We're the only two theoreticians in RTH. So, so, so uh, this semester, we, our teaching schedule was aligned. That he's also teaching at 2 in the afternoon, I do. So I, I'm meeting him uh, for an hour every other week. So, so I suddenly began to talk to him a lot about the past. Yeah. So I would tell him, this uh, just a lecture on this. Yeah. So any question up to here? Uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, partially I decided to go uh, against using the graph as morphism. It's because we are much more familiar with this uh, quadratic residual things. So um, I think probably, you know, give me a clean lecture, I will just stop here. Right. I don't want to mess that. Just stop here. <laughs> just stop here now, right? So next time uh, uh, we'll have uh, one. Uh, uh, Lecture. I send out emails. Uh, who is in my email? I think Ed, you are my email list, right? And uh, you are. Yeah. If one of you are, uh, if you, some of you is not ready, don't worry. Don't don't already push yourself. We do have opening. Um, it's 14, right? 14. Yeah. So we have opening. It just uh, is loosed up on our schedule a little bit. So let me know. And uh, if not, then we'll. I will pair up with you. I will pair up with you. Okay, see you guys.